Whoa, the light from outside your window just got brighter. It's 9.30 in the evening, and you have a huge exam coming up tomorrow. You peek outside to see if your neighbors use their floodlights again. But they're outside looking up in the sky. You stick your head out and notice that the moon got a lot bigger, double in size. You run outside and ask people what's going on. But they don't have a clue either. You take a picture of it and post it on social media. You view your feed and see that everyone is talking about it. The dark sky is brighter because the moon has more real estate to reflect light from the sun, making the light more intense. You can feel a slight imbalance while walking. Every time you take a step, it feels like you're walking lighter than usual. Because the moon became so large, its gravitational pull became stronger, so gravity became weaker. Suddenly, you look below you and feel your socks are wet. You run and hop on the top of a car and see that there's water flooding your neighborhood. Everyone tries to find higher ground or run back to their houses. This isn't a fire hydrant that busted and is spewing out water. This is ocean water seeping in. You're confused and lose your balance. You slip and fall in the water as it rises. Some people are in their cars, but they can't drive anywhere because of the water. You live near the ocean, but there has never been a tsunami or any flood reports in your whole life. There are no reported earthquakes around the area, so something strange is happening. You run back to your house, trying to see if you can get out your old inflatable raft to help you with the flood. The only problem is that you need to inflate it but don't have your pump. You inflate it with your mouth at first, but it'll take forever to pump it up. You search around your house for an alternative and find your hairdryer. You plug it in and inflate the raft as much as you can until you use your mouth to do the rest. The water level rises by every second and has now entered your house. You pack up a bag with a good flashlight, some food, and thermal blankets. You go downstairs and see that the water is now at your knees. You keep walking until you reach the door. When you step outside, the water pushes you left and right since the waves are very harsh. Since gravity has changed, it's not easy to swim around. You get your raft ready and use it to float yourself down the current in your street. It doesn't help that the water is freezing, and you're in the middle of February. After a while, you reach the highway where water is coming directly from the beach. You manage to get on a high surface and take out your phone. You kept it in a protective compartment in your bag for safety. You only have 15% battery left, but you brought your power bank. You call your family to see what's going on, but they too have no idea. You venture into the forest and try to spot an old cabin you used to visit as a child to see if you left your old bicycle there. After a few minutes, you find it and bike across the mountain to escape the flood. You can't seem to balance yourself since the gravity is affecting you. Some scientists sit around with laptops and spreadsheets, attempting to understand what's happening. Everyone is shouting and throwing out random solutions, but nothing seems to make sense. After a while, the head of NASA decides to launch an unmanned rocket to the moon. The rocket is ready in a few hours, and everyone is awaiting orders. 3, 2, 1, blast off! The rocket soars in the air and approaches the moon. It exits the Earth's atmosphere and travels at full speed in that direction. After a day or two, everyone gets live footage of the giant moon. According to the studies, the rocket can't be too close to the moon since it may have a stronger gravitational pull. However, the footage shows that tiny particles are floating around it, similar to Saturn's rings. These rings look like a giant disk surrounding the large planet, but up close, they're just particles that are the size of rice grains to the extent of a large bus. They're orbiting Saturn because of the gravitational pull. The images show that these particles are big and small, which doesn't make it safe for the rocket to get any closer. So it suspends itself nearby to orbit the moon and unleashes a mini-rocket that looks like a drone to get closer. The particles are many miles thick, making it difficult for the mini-rocket to maneuver. It flies closer and the particles start crashing on it. It's a good thing that the mini-rocket is durable for this. The rocket finally gets past the particles and lands on the moon. Gravity has gotten stronger since it inflated in size, which almost broke the rocket. As soon as it lands, another robot pulls out and starts driving around the surface, trying to get some clues. As of now, nothing is happening. 
but they're noticing some quivers coming from deep inside the moon. The moon's core is reacting abnormally. It looks like it's getting bigger and bigger. Scientists don't know if it will stop growing at a certain point, so the only way to find out is to drill a hole deep inside to uncover the reason. You're pedaling away and reach the other side of the mountain. The ground is shaking, and your balance is getting worse. You look across the mountain and see that the whole other side of town is flooded. You get your raft and supplies and make it there. You find a rowboat and paddle as fast as you can until you reach the lighthouse. From there, you can try to find the NASA station. Suddenly, you see a large rocket erupt from the ground and into the sky. You know for a fact that your brother is there, working. But cellular networks are down. You paddle your way there for safety. The little rocket that landed unleashes a small drill strong enough to go miles to the center. It'll take days for it to reach down. So NASA is already launching another rocket to fly off and bring a bigger drill. The only problem is that the moon is getting bigger, so the particles around the moon also gather a lot more. The moon is reaching the Earth's size, getting bigger by the minute. The flood could reach several coastal states, and many micro-islands could be submerged, so it needs to be prevented. Gravity could affect the structure of most of the buildings, causing them to collapse one by one. But the little robot will not let that happen, so he's drilling to figure out what's going on with the moon. Some of the rocks appear to be getting hotter as it digs. This could be a sign of the moon expanding, which might ultimately explode. The scientists in the room are baffled and don't know what to do. The lead scientist, who is your brother, calls you, but he can't reach you. Meanwhile, you're still paddling around, trying to get to NASA. On your way, you head back to the mountains to stay on dry land. When you arrive back at the old cabin, you see some strange men wearing trench coats looking for you. There's a stare-off until they chase you. They seem odd, like they're not from Earth. The drill has reached its maximum depth and can't go down any longer. Also, the control transmission is getting weaker. Suddenly, a figure pops out of nowhere and flashes its lights on the robot. The transmission chops and only show little snippets of the giant figure eyeing the robot. A little creature descends from the figure and walks toward the robot. Everyone at NASA is freaking out and recording every single frame. No one can believe what's going on. After a while, the creature transmits a signal that NASA can't decipher. But the creature seems friendly. The creature gets back into its ship and in an instant disappears into thin air as it teleports away. The moon starts shrinking. It's getting back to its normal size. Everyone celebrates in NASA and around the world. The currents become calmer and retreat to the coast. It's a good thing everyone reached the higher hills before. The large ball of fire thousands of miles away from us is the brightest object in our solar system, as well as the biggest. If Jupiter was the size of a basketball, then the Earth would look like a tiny little grape. But the Sun makes even Jupiter look like a joke. That big burning ball in the sky is made up of hydrogen and helium and is 864,000 miles in diameter, making it more than 100 times wider than our little blue planet. It's 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit just on the surface, and 27 million degrees at the core. The Moon, on the other hand, is a little easier to grasp at at around 2,160 miles in diameter, which is only less than a third of Earth. It might seem pretty big floating in the sky, but that's because it's the closest object to us. But what if the tables, or in this case, celestial bodies, have turned, and the moon suddenly became brighter than the sun? Let's explore several scenarios. Scenario 1. If the moon becomes brighter than the sun, the nights will be brighter than days. It means your sleep cycle will be disrupted. All nocturnal animals will be utterly confused. When is it time to go out and eat now? In the extreme north and south poles, the nights and days are for months on end. So people living in the area already have an idea of what it's like to sleep at 11 p.m. with the sun shining brightly above them. For the rest of us, it won't be easy. Let's say you're out camping and prepare an awesome meal and gear up for the dark nights. As you trek into the forest, you find a spot that has an awesome view of the lake and the clear sky above. 
It's 7 p.m. and you start a fire for some s'mores and get the telescope ready. The only problem is that when the sun begins to set, the moon lights up the sky even brighter. It's surprisingly not as hot as you'd imagine, since it's not direct sunlight. But regardless, it's still pretty hot. Scenario 2. Temperatures will surely rise either way. That means snow will melt away faster than you can go, what? What's going on? The snow on the mountains will be the first to melt, followed by the polar caps. With so much heat, the sea levels will rise and take small remote islands scattered across the ocean underwater. Coastal towns will go down and everyone will live closer inward. This will likely cause a chain reaction in the world economy. There will be no more winters, which means no more winter activities like skiing, snowboarding, or snow fights. Animals and plants all around the world will be affected. The world will turn into a large desert. Water will get scarce over the years, but people will find a way to preserve it. Scenario 3. You're sitting behind your desk, bored. You're losing business. People aren't buying as many sunglasses as you thought. But when the moon suddenly becomes brighter than the sun, and everyone needs to wear those glasses 24-7 when heading outside, you can't keep up with the demand for sunglasses. So you hire more people and grow your business. You eventually become the best sunglasses business in the country. They don't recommend looking up at the sky at any point of the day or night. Cities are covered with large visors to reduce the brightness every day. Sunglasses will come in different sizes and shapes for different times of the day. Some will be like goggles strapped around your head, while others will be like large helmets. Scenario 4. The moon's atmosphere is so thin that it can't contain anything in it. Just like over deserts on Earth, there are no clouds to bring some rain, which is why it's always hot or cold. Yeah, the biggest desert in the world is the whole continent of Antarctica, which is a cold, barren desert, contrary to what people think of the Sahara Desert. So if you still want to land on the moon, you better think twice now. People who are working at the International Space Station will have to find a new office. The moon will be too bright to bear, considering how close they are. If the moon is just brighter than the sun without the heat part, then the space station will only require adjustments to keep the light out. The reason why we see the moon in various shapes is because of its position in relation to the sun. The moon doesn't rotate, unlike Earth. It's kind of glued to us and is always showing the same side. So, depending on the moon's position during the month, we'll have a super bright night during the full moon and relatively shiny nights during the rest of the month. Scenario 5. If the moon became brighter than the sun, it would produce more heat than the sun and probably become larger. Gravity on Earth would change significantly because of the moon's new size. The whole orbit structure would change and affect the celestial objects floating in space. Planets would soon begin to orbit around the moon. Earth might move further away from the sun. If that happened, then everything would have to readjust to the radical changes in gravity. Weak gravity means buildings wouldn't have a solid foundation to sit on and would eventually collapse. Bridges and large monuments would also fail to hold up. People wouldn't be able to walk properly and would do it in a funny way. Scenario 6. In many of these scenarios, I mentioned how the moon would be brighter than the object emitting light. But in this case, the sun would have to come from the moon reflecting from the sun, which means that the sun would have to be twice as bright as it is now. If the sun got 100 times bigger, it would shoot out more rays, which can be damaging and throw off a lot of radiation, harmful to every living thing on Earth. The gravitational pull of the sun might attract more planets to orbit around it and cause other objects in space to join the orbit. The planets would be partying in our galaxy club, and we might be thrown off our orbit course. Of course, this would pose a bigger risk to everything on Earth as things would get hotter and drier than before. Scenario 7. If we're talking about the moon getting brighter, we can also assume it would get closer to Earth than it is now. The brightness won't be the problem here as gravity will cause major changes on Earth. But every day, 24-7 will be high tide. It will be so extreme that there will be constant floods in every coastal town. All islands will be submerged, which will increase the population of inland cities. Marine life will be having the time of its life when water overtakes the land. Boats will have to be re-engineered for new conditions as well as submarines. 
Air travel will be the priority, but large cruise ships will look futuristic and have an extra build to sustain the harsh waves. Nighttime will be pretty bright on regular days. It will raise the global temperature, which will melt down the snow, causing the sea levels to increase even more. Comets and other celestial objects will be drawn to a closer gravitational pull, so we will always have to look up whenever we go outside. But no worries, the moon is still up there as it is for a very long time. The Earth and the moon's relationship is complicated. Luckily, we only have one natural satellite. Other planets in our solar system have multiple moons revolving around them. Some are so huge that they're the size of Earth. Imagine several of those affecting our home. But that's a topic for a completely different story. When you see it in the sky, it looks round, but the moon is more of an oval shape, similar to a lemon. This shape, flattened with a bulge on each side, came out billions of years ago when extremely hot tidal forces shaped its crust. They heated up some regions more than others. Gravity from our planet has helped to exaggerate this lemon shape over time. When they were getting ready to send missions to the moon, some researchers were worried because there was a thick layer of dust on the lunar surface. They were afraid seas of dust were both soft and thick enough to swallow their lunar lander. But even though the surface there is dusty, this layer is just too thin to cause complications. Our moon certainly isn't the biggest one in the solar system. The champion here is Ganymede, one of the 79 moons circling around Jupiter. But our moon is the largest in relation to its parent planet. It has a diameter of more than 2,000 miles, which is slightly bigger than the quarter of the size of the Earth. Pluto, for instance, has a smaller moon to planet ratio. Its biggest moon, Charon, is almost the size of Pluto, which is why it looks like a double dwarf planet system. How long would a walk around the moon take you? When the Apollo astronauts were there, they managed a walking speed of approximately 1.3 miles per hour. On average, you walk twice as fast down on Earth. The low gravitational force on the moon would give you significantly less traction on the ground, but those special spacesuits astronauts were wearing were never actually designed for long-distance hikes. In theory, you could maybe reach the speed of 3 miles per hour before you'd need to break into a run. At this pace, you travel 6,770 miles, which means making a circle around the moon in 91 days if you're walking non-stop. Why does the moon change its shape? It goes through different phases each month, starting from the new moon and gradually going to the full moon, just to do the same thing all over again, but in reverse. The sunlight hits one half of the moon at a time. This gives it a night and a day side, just like we have it here on Earth. The shape we see the moon in depends on where it's located compared to the sun. If it's directly between us and the sun, the sunlight only hits the side we don't see. That's a new moon. It appears completely dark in that phase. But when it comes to the far side of our planet from the sun, its day side completely faces the Earth. That's when we see a full moon. After the initial phase, when the moon is new, we'll see more of its surface in the sky as it orbits our planet. It's something we call waxing. The moon in this phase first becomes a crescent. The first quarter moon is when it's half full. After that, it goes into a gibbous moon phase, when it's larger than half full, but not yet full. After it reaches the full moon phase, it slowly shrinks and goes through the same phases but in the opposite direction. While up on the moon, you'd probably see human footprints there. True, no one has stepped there since the last Apollo mission in 1972 and the footsteps may stay there for many years because there's no geological activities on the moon, like earthquakes or volcanoes. There are no winds, rain, or other things that could erase these footprints. How would you get to the moon? Rockets are probably the first thing that comes to your mind, but a lunar elevator could be an even better solution because traveling in a rocket would be a difficult, expensive, and pretty dangerous way to try to reach the lunar surface. Why would people want to go there? It's not just about craters, an amazing view of our home planet, or other unique things the moon offers.
It's also full of resources like a rare form of helium. Humans could use it in fusion power stations on Earth. We could extract some other rare elements too, and use them for smartphones and other gadgets. For a lunar elevator, we need to stretch a cable anchored to the moon's surface for 250,000 miles towards the Earth. We wouldn't be able to attach it directly to our planet because both Earth and the moon are moving. But we could terminate high in our planet's orbit. We'd have solar-powered robotic shuttles that would move up and down the cable. This is like having a conveyor belt to ferry rare and precious resources our way. The cable would be as thick as a pencil and would weigh 40 tons. It sounds expensive, but a lunar elevator would most likely pay for itself within only 53 trips. The moon is in constant motion. It rotates on its axis and circles around the Earth, and it makes the same amount of time for the moon to make a circle around the Earth and rotate once on its axis, compared to our planet, which rotates on its axis every 24 hours and makes a full circle around the sun in 365 days. So, the moon is tidally locked to our planet, which is why we always see the same side of the moon. One theory says the moon probably formed when a large Mars-sized object from our solar system hit the Earth. They collided 4.5 billion years ago when the solar system was still in its early stage, which was pretty chaotic. If this theory is correct, around 60% of the Moon is made of lighter elements that are also present in the outer layer of our planet. A lucky set of circumstances lets us see total solar eclipses from our planet. The Moon is the perfect size and distance from the Earth to appear the same size as the Sun when we're looking at it in the sky. When the Moon passes between the Sun and us, it covers the Sun perfectly. Plus, you can see an impressive halo that illuminates its edges. If it were any farther from us or smaller, a solar eclipse would only look like there's a blot on the sun. Our moon contains the water that kinda jumps around. There's water there locked up in ice. Some water molecules move around the surface as the moon cools and warms during the day. The water gets stuck on its surface until the lunar midday, when the sun is above the upper branch of any of the moon's meridians. At this point, some of the water melts, heats up, and ends up in the delicate lunar atmosphere. Its atmosphere generally contains some unusual gases, including potassium and sodium. Venus, Mars, and Earth don't have these in their atmospheres, so the water stays and floats there until it gets to a cooler area. Then it settles back to the surface. There's a specific anomaly under the surface of the south pole of the Moon a giant and extremely dense blob of metal lodged in the mantle. And, most likely, it's altering the moon's gravitational field. No one knows how such a huge blob of metal ended up trapped under the lunar surface. It could perhaps be remnants of the iron-nickel asteroid. Four billion years ago, this asteroid crashed into the far side of the lunar surface and created this enormous South Pole Aitken crater. Our natural satellite is shrinking. Its interior is cooling, which results in the Moon getting over 150 feet skinnier just as a grape wrinkles as it's shrinking down. But a grape has flexible skin and the lunar surface crust is brittle. That's why it breaks as the Moon is getting smaller. That way, it forms thrust faults. One section of crust pushes over the closest part. This has been going on for the past few hundred million years. These lunar faults are still active they probably produce moonquakes as the moon gradually shrinks and cools all the time. Some of these quakes are strong, maybe 5 on the Richter scale. During their orbit around the moon, astronauts took images of Ina, a quite unusual volcanic deposit. Ina is not that old. It might have been formed somewhere between 3.5 and 1 billion years ago. The volcanoes on the moon were probably active during the age of dinosaurs. If only they could have invented telescopes! They'd probably have a magnificent view of lava oozing from the lunar surface from time to time. The Moon has its own time zone called Lunar Standard Time. It doesn't correspond with the time on our planet. A year on the Moon lasts 12 days. Each day is about as long as a month on Earth. These days got their names after astronauts who walked on the Moon. The days are divided into 30 cycles. 
the cycles are divided into hours, minutes, and seconds. The calendar started when Neil Armstrong set his foot on the moon on July 21, 1969.